Uh, let's say this out loud together. Ready? Number three. Ready? We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, his conception by the Holy Spirit, his virgin birth, his sinless life, his substitutionary death on the cross, his bodily resurrection, and his ascension to the right hand of the Father. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, some would say this is harder to memorize because it's longer, but it's not. It's actually easier. Number three, three being the Trinity, the deity of Christ. See? Trinity, deity of Christ, right? So you remember it's number three, deity of Jesus, and then just start going through his life. His birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, right? And you can remember all of that. And uh, so uh, if you remember that and just went through his life, you got it. Boom, done, right? Memorized. You don't have to do every excellent word. You say, hey, three, Trinity. He's Jesus is God. And he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born of a virgin. He lived a, a sinless life. He died on the cross. He was resurrected. He ascended in the right hand of the Father. See, that was all memorized. My eyes closed. See, and so you got that down. Number three. Easy, easy peasy, right? All right. Let's get into today's message. Um, today's message is probably one of the most talked about topics ever in human life. Because th th this message I preach, and most every message I have either speaks of it, alludes to it, something like that. But today's message is going to be completely 100% about the topic of eternal life. Think about it. Every religion, every culture, every race, every generation has a, has a fascination about the afterlife, has, about, has a fascination about making our lives last longer, has had a fascination with immortality. And, and you say, well, why is it the most talked about? Look, look at the, announce, the uh, advertising on TV. Try this cream and, and that, this surgery and this lift and that lift and this pill. And, you know, they're all talking about trying to extend your life, right? Mankind has tried everything from drinking from some special water of a, a fountain to putting creams on them, themselves uh, to religious ceremonies, killing babies to expand their life and live forever. We can even see people asking the same question in the Bible. We see in the Bible, uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 18, there's a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, rabbi, uh, master, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's asking him, help me out here. The odd part, or maybe the sad part about that verse is that the one who created life is rarely sought out. He did come to him, but he didn't come to say, good master, can I have more of you? Can I know you more? He went to him, and very few people will even go to God to seek him, or even seek his teaching about eternal life. And even sadder that those who do go to him Typically, after hearing his words about eternal life, don't like the answer or think that it can't be that easy. Surely there must be something that I must do, right? There must be something that mankind can do. What must I do to inherit eternal life? But if God could give you a whole list, and actually he has, 613 Mosaic Laws. You say, I thought there was only 10 commandments. The 10 commandments are just the first 10. It's kind of like the outline of the rest of them. There's actually 613 laws in the Old Testament. So he gave us a law. He gave us a list, right? We'd come back with him and say, okay, well, that's, that's great. I, I appreciate that. But since I'm going to do something to gain it, could you make it something that I will not mind doing? Or even make it that it's something that's real easy. Or even better, do something that I'm already doing and I'm good at it. Right? Isn't that what they've asked God and Jesus all this time? Right? What's one thing they even asked Jesus? What's one thing? What's one law that we could, we could 
we could do. The Jews were asking what law, and here's the one they suggested. Uh, circumcision. Let's just make a circumcision. We're already doing that. We, we got that down. Eight days, psh, baby's done. Circumcision, we're in. Good. They're part of the family. Whew. It's one law. Can we, can we make it that one? That, literally, that's what they asked. That's what they wanted. Turn me down just a little bit, bud. Thank that's what they wanted. They wanted something easy, something they're already doing. And so here's what happened when Jesus answered this, this ruler. He said, uh, he gave me this, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Do those. And notice he didn't even give 613, and he didn't even give you the full 10. He just kind of gave him the highlights, right? And uh, <laughs> their young ruler answered this way. He goes, oh, yeah, I've done those since I was young. So I'm good? Right? That's all I needed to do? And Jesus then upped the ante by being very clear with him and even more clear than before. He wanted to show what his heart was about doing those things. So it's not about just doing them. It's what your heart is doing those things. He said, all right, sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then... Come follow me. That should do it. But listen to the response of the rich ruler. He said, when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich, and then walked away. He left talking with the creator God, the redeeming Christ, the one who could give him life, sorrowful. So sad. No pun intended. Can you imagine coming to a, a gathering of your church Sunday morning and you walk in and you're like, I just, man, I'm struggling. I'm having problems this morning. Uh, I'm not sure about eternal life. I'd like to know about that. Or I mean, and you come in and you hear the answer, the message from God's word. And you go, that wasn't what I wanted to hear. I have to go find another church to find what I needed to hear. Wow. It came right from God's word. He didn't like that, huh? The answer came right from God's word. The living word of God, Christ, said, here's what you do. And he walked away sorrowful. I heard the statement once, and I put it up here so you could read it with me. If you choose to believe in Jesus and give him your life, you will get, uh, you will get to experience joy in this life an indescribable joy in the next. Let me say it again to make sure that you heard it. If you choose to believe in Jesus and give him your life, you will get to experience joy in this life and indescribable joy in the next. Now this sounds very good and very religious. And some of you may have nodded in agreement, but it is not at all biblical. Yeah. What, 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 what do you say? Sound biblically? Of course it does. Because we make things sound biblical because we put good biblical stuff in there. Think about it this way. When you are born, according to the Bible, you are born spiritually dead. Right? You are spiritually dead. We are seeking life. We're seeking eternal life. What must I do to gain eternal life? Because I am dead right now. So based on that statement, we are to give our spiritually dead life to Jesus. And a dead life is no life at all. It doesn't really make sense because if we had life to give, we wouldn't need life. If you're already alive, you don't need to be alive again. We're dead. Spiritually dead. People who are alive do not need to be revived. People who are dead need to be given life. Jesus does not uh, need our dead life, our deadness, in order to give us eternal life. It's not like we go, Jesus, here's my dead life. And Jesus goes, oh, good, I need that. Here, let me reshape that a little bit here and blow, blow some stuff into it and shake it around a little bit and give it back to you. No, he says, yeah, it's dead. Just, just There's nothing there. Here's life. That's what he does. I also seen this statement, and I'm going to say it again. You're probably going to go, okay, there's a trick to this one too. Let's listen to it. 
When you gain eternal life, you get to go to heaven. Why is heaven so great? No suffering, no pain, no evil, the absence of anything bad, no crying, no tears, no taxes, no recessions. Is there a real choice to make here? How could anyone turn this down? These are both quotes that I've read recently and looked at. There are so many things wrong with this statement. I could spend all day long. But the thing I see the most disturbing is what's missing in that? Jesus. Where's Jesus at, right? Gaining eternal life is not about giving your dead life to Jesus. Gaining eternal life is not about cool things we'll get to see and do in heaven or what we won't have to worry about to heaven. People say this all the time. Oh, I'm so sorry you're crying. Remember, you need to come to Jesus because there's no crying in heaven. And I actually have a scripture verse that goes against that. But anyway, um, <laughs> they're like, oh, I hate that. So stop telling people all the goodies. It's like going, let's go to McDonald's. I know you don't like the food, but they give you a, a treat. The food is not really that good, so giving them a plastic treat is not a you know, positive for that, right? It's about life. It's about eternal life, and that life is Jesus. Jesus made this statement, And uh, you may already understand, uh, already know the statement, but do you understand what he's saying here? John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The life. He did not say, I am the one who can give life, but he said, I am life itself. He did not say, I'm the one that wants or receives your life. He said, I am life itself. Jesus is a source of eternal life because he is life and he is eternal. Without Jesus, we live in the darkness of death, incapable and unable to have life at all. There is nothing you can do within yourself to gain, inherit, or secure eternal life. If you're one who is seeking the source of eternal life today, this lesson this morning will help you more than you can imagine. Listen, you may be the best moral person that ever lived, but still remain in complete, utter darkness of death. You may be a leader in the church. You may be the most educated and knowledgeable person about God's word, but still live in darkness of death because you have not life. Jesus is a source of eternal life because he is life. Because he is life. And you can be a member of this church for 50 years, knowing Bible terms and doing good things, teaching Sunday school, but not been given life. You are spiritually darkness of death. But I'll have this thought. You may have received life. You may have already uh, been given eternal life, but you don't understand it. You say, well, how can you get it without understanding it? You don't have to know all the aspects of Jesus to get it. But once you get it, you should learn. Because you said, now come learn of me, right? You got to keep learning. You may be the leader in the church. You may be the most educated, knowledgeable person, but live like you are still in darkness of death. You may be a member of this church for 50 years, know Bible teachings, teach Sunday school, and do all good things. But you live like you're still in the darkness of death because you don't understand what you've been given. And that is eternal life already. John's gospel is a key book in understanding life and, and salvation and, and how to obtain eternal life. And John writes in chapter 20, he says, believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. One of the main purposes of the book of John is so that by believing in Christ, we might receive life. In fact, when people come to me and they say, I don't know anything about the Bible, I don't know anything about God, I, I don't believe in God, whatever, I almost always will give them the book of John to start with because it's an easy book to understand. It explains who Jesus is. It explains what life is. It explains what, what grace is. It explains what love is. It explains what Jesus did for us. It's all there in the book of John. To believe in Christ is to have faith. That he is the redeeming Christ who died to take away our sins and rose from the dead to give us life. Jesus offers who, those who believe in him eternal life. We usually think that this means a life that never ends. 
but that's only a shadow of the definition and only begins to scratch the surface. What does the Bible mean when it refers to eternal life? If I was going to ask you to stand up and give me a definition of eternal life, don't worry, I'm not going to do that. But if I would, and you stood up, you may give me something like this. Well, to have eternal life means that we get to live forever with God in heaven. Or we're not spiritually dead. We will not die a spiritual death. And you may, you know, those are good ideas and not necessarily wrong, but just partial truths. Just partial truths. And they're great truths, but only partial truth. I would say those are not complete in their definition. And Jesus' prayer the night before he was crucified, he gave us a clue about what eternal life is. Look at this verse here in John chapter 17, verse 3. This is eternal life. Right? He's about to tell us, right? That they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing the only true God, Jesus Christ. It is not knowing about God. It is not knowing about Jesus. Eternal life is knowing and having a relationship with Christ. A relationship means that we are his children, his family. A relationship means that we talk with him and he talks with us. A relationship means that we know him and he knows us. A relationship means that he loves us and we love him. Because Christ is life. When we have life, we have Christ. He lives in us. He is a part of who we are. So many people in churches today, they live a judgmental life with no mercy. They live in misery. They live in discontent. They live in fear. This is because they do not understand what having life means. So if I came to you and said, okay, you're uh, eight years old and you're in Sunday school back there and Miss Cindy's back there teaching junior church and uh, she, she looks at all the kids. Let's say we have 20 kids. She looks at all the kids and say, hey kids, today I'm going to talk to you about hell. And she goes through and describes what hell is and how bad it is. And she says, how many of you kids want to go to hell? And all the kids are like, and she says, I didn't think so. So how many of y'all want to go to heaven instead? And they're all raising their hand, right? Every, all 20 of them would. Except little Johnny back there. He, he probably was like, I don't know. Right? But let's just say all 20 raise their hand. And then she says, if you want to go to heaven, repeat after me. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, I love you. I love you. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. You know, right? And they go through the sinner's prayer, right? And they go through it. Amen. Amen. All of you all, just as Jesus come into your heart, that is so wonderful. We're all going to heaven. Let's go into the auditorium. And tell all the adults that you accepted Christ today and you're saved and whatever. And so they all come forward and all 20 of them come running in here. We're like, oh, that's awesome, you know. And then the pastor says, well, let's just baptize them. And they go back there and they baptize all 20 of them. And they all give them a baptismal certificate at eight years of age. They're all accepted Jesus. They're all said these things, whatever. And they put their Bible and they move away. And mom never takes them to church again. But when they're like 18, they open up their Bible that they found in a box somewhere. And they pulled it out and said, baptismal certificate. Oh, that's right. I'm going to heaven. And they start going to church and the church says, have you been baptized? Yes, I have. Here's my certificate. And they're like, oh, that's great. And they go to church for a couple of years and they're going to church for a couple of years. And they go, you know what? I'm going to teach the youth. I want to become the youth teacher. And so they start teaching the youth or whatever. And one day at youth camp, the pastor says something about eternal life and gives a message similar to this one. And they went, did I do that? All this time they thought they had. But they were still spiritually dead because the words that they repeated weren't necessarily what they believed. They just repeated words because they were going, that has happened so often. In fact, that's exactly what happened in the church that Cindy and I began to go to when we first started going to church again. And we walked back to the junior church, and that's exactly what they were doing. Every week, the same kids raised their hands, and every week they got resaved. All right? So if you're in a situation like that, and you come to church, and now you're 40, 50, 60 years old, like, I've been serving Sunday school all the time. I have a certificate. I must have done it when I was eight. But you're living your life like you're miserable. You might want to rethink it. Or you can remember. I remember exactly when I was turned 18. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. I said the words at the auditorium. I mean, at the, at the front there, the pastor said some words. I repeated the words. I really believed it. But then you sat in the pew the rest of your life, and you're still miserable. Did you really understand what you got? You received life. 
Why are you acting like you're dead? See, this is the idea, the thought. So many people in, in Christian churches uh, do not have peace, do not have joy, do not have contentment. If you say, well, I don't know if I do, and you might want to check your salvation to start with. You might want to check your relationship with Christ. But if you have a relationship with him and you still don't have joy, you still don't have contentment, then I'd say you might want to re-examine your understanding of what eternal life is and what you have and what is inside you already. Eternal life is a current real relationship with Christ with the one who is life. And that relationship begins the moment that you believe that he is the Christ who died for you and was raised from the death to give you life. Then you put your faith, your believing trust in him for your eternal life in spite of your dead life that you had before. If you think that living in heaven with Jesus is the beginning of your eternal life, you're mistaken and missing out on so much more. The Bible says that eternal life had no beginning, and that eternal life, never beginning, never ending, is in you. Eternal means eternal, never ending, never uh, beginning. Again, salvation began the moment that you believe that Jesus is the Christ who died for you and was raised from the death to give you life, and then put your faith, your believing trust in him for eternal life in spite of the dead life that you had already. Eternal life emphasizes the quality and character of the life of God himself. Physical life, at its best, is fleeting and momentarily. But eternal life is God himself. Eternal life is a fullness of God himself. First Peter one twenty three says, for you have been born again, not from perishable seed, but imperishable through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The living word of God, who is Christ, is life itself. He lives and abides in you forever. So now ask yourself this question again in your life. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the answer that he will answer you to this is, do, son, do, daughter. You cannot do anything because everything that needed to be done has already been done for you. The question is not, what must I do, child? The question is, do you believe me and what I just told you? Romans 10, 9 says this. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God is raising from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you believe that Christ is the creator God, the redeeming Christ, the resurrected life giver, then put your trust in Christ as your savior and you will receive life. This is the act, if you want to call it that, of receiving life. If you say, well, what must I do? My answer is, you don't have to do anything. You just have to believe. Well, that's a doing, isn't it? Okay, if you want to be technical. You used to believe one thing. You had to do something for salvation. Or you did not need salvation. Or you didn't believe in God at all. Or you didn't believe in Christ at all. That was what you believed. You used to believe something. That something was wrong. And now you heard the truth. You heard something that stirred your heart. You, you heard something that went, I believe this, but now I believe that. You changed your mind to what you did believe, which is wrong, to what you now has been given to you as truth from God's word. You believe it. You change your mind. The right belief of Christ is your Savior. That is repentance. A changing of your mind of what you was wrong to what is truth. This is what Paul tells the church in Ephesus. I love this verse. Acts chapter 20, verse 20. He says, I did not keep you from declaring what was beneficial to you and teaching you publicly from house to house, testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that? It wasn't anything to do with sin. It was your belief I, I went around telling you the truth and, and I didn't do all that. I didn't keep anything from you. You believed this and that was wrong. Now you believe this and this is right. 
you repented unto God. If you have already received life from Christ, then ask this question in your life. If I have received eternal life, what does that do for me now? And Christ will answer that question with, this is eternal life, that you may know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. No Jesus. No Jesus. And then what he says, he says, you want peace, you're struggling, whatever, come to me, take my yoke upon you, right? And he says, come, learn of me. No Jesus. No Jesus. You want peace in your heart? I will give you rest. No Jesus. That's what it says. And when you know the only true God, you know the Christ whom he has sent to give you life, and your life will begin to manifest that truth outwardly. Your life cannot show anything other than the Christ who gave you life, since Christ is life, if that's what you believe, and that's what you know, and that's what you focused on. If you constantly are remembering, and I have eternal life, what does that mean? I have Christ in me, the one who is life in me every day. And you get excited about that, what's your life going to look like? It's going to look like Jesus. When you truly understand what that life is and what life has done in you and what is done to you, others will see Christ in your life. So you say, well, you're talking about that misery and that lack of peace and that, that, that discontentment or whatever. It's because you don't know either one, you don't have it, or two, you don't know what you have. It's like receiving a gift and you open up the present and you whatever and you're like, okay, it's a tool of some kind. I don't know what it is, so I'm going to put it in my closet. <laughs> I'm like, hey, did you give that tool I got you? And I'm like, yeah, I sure did. Thanks for the tool. And one day you're out in your shop and you're trying to do something. You're like, man, I wish I had a tool that would do this. And you call me up and say, hey, do you have a tool I can borrow that'll do this? And I go, yeah, that's the one I gave you. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> you already have it. And not that eternal life is a tool. I'm just saying. If you've received it already, you already have it. It's already there. Do you have eternal life? If you have it already, why is it not seen in all that you do? Why is the eternal life, the Christ, in you, why is it not seen in everything that you do? Why is your life still acting miserable? Why are you still discontent? Why don't you have joy? Why don't you have love? Why don't you have peace? I don't know what I have. I thought I have to ask for it. I thought I have to pray for it. It's already there. You have to pray for more peace. It's already given to you. You have to pray for more life. You already have all the life you need. I have to pray for more joy. It's already been given to you. You just don't know it. If you did not have eternal life this morning, why not ask God to give it to you today? By believing and trusting in your heart in him who died, in him who was resurrected for you. He was resurrected to be your one and only Savior, to give you eternal life. So if you have already today, let's begin living our life like we have it. If you haven't received it today, let's begin to think about receiving it, to think about, should I believe? Should I repent unto God who loves me and died for me? It's today the day for your salvation. Let me pray with you all this morning.